All right, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for being here on time. Uh, appreciate you making that effort. Hope you had a great weekend. Hope you had a great day today back after, after a nice four-day weekend. A couple of things. Three-day weekend. Well, yeah. Kind of spread. But I was still uh, just a couple of things. Um, Uzella, any feedback on Uzella? Anybody want to just share a little bit with what you've experienced with somebody else? Share with us. Love it in what way? Good. Yes. I think it's the worst thing you ever did for me because I spent more time wasting looking at cool articles on Uzella. <laughs> Don't worry, we're tracking who's on there. <laughs> Any other feedback? Yes.
Okay. Some of you um, perhaps have read um, some of some of the research that we're going to talk about based on growth mindset. This is the is it Wick? Um, Wick, Wick, Wick. Carol. Carol Brick. So it, it's work. That, it's some of the work that again, some of you I think are you teaching that mindset in your in, in one of your classes. Um, so let me just go, let's go through this little video first and see what resonates with you in terms of the students that we're working with and what our jobs require of us. When I was 27 years old, I left a very demanding job in management consulting for a job that was even more demanding, teaching. I went to teach seventh graders math in the New York City public schools. And like any teacher, I made quizzes and tests, I gave out homework assignments. When the work came back, I calculated grades. What struck me was that IQ was not the only difference between my best and my worst students. Some of my strongest performers did not have stratospheric IQ scores. Some of my smartest kids weren't doing so well. And that got me thinking. The kinds of things you need to learn in seventh grade math, sure, they're hard. Ratios, decimals, the area of a parallelogram. But these concepts are not impossible. And I was firmly convinced that every one of my students could learn the material if they worked hard and long enough. After several more years of teaching, I came to the conclusion that what we need in education is a much better understanding of students and learning from a motivational perspective, from a psychological perspective. In education, the one thing we know how to measure best is IQ. school and in life depends on much more than your ability to learn quickly and easily. So I left the classroom and I went to graduate school to become a psychologist. I started studying kids and adults in all kinds of super challenging settings. And in every study my question was, who is successful here and why? My research team and I went to West Point Military Academy. We tried to predict which cadets would stay in military training and which would drop out. We went to the National Spelling Bee and tried to predict which children would advance farthest in competition. We studied rookie teachers working in really tough neighborhoods, asking which teachers are still going to be here in teaching by the end of the school year. And of those, who will be the most effective at improving learning outcomes for their students? We partnered with private companies asking, which of these salespeople is going to keep their jobs? And who's going to earn the most money? In all those very different contexts, one characteristic emerged as a significant predictor of success. And it wasn't social intelligence, it wasn't good looks, <coughs> physical health, and it wasn't IQ. It was grit. Grit is passion and perseverance for very long-term goals. Grit is having stamina. Grit is sticking with your future, day in, day out, not just for the week, not just for the month, but for years, and working really hard to make that future a reality. Grit is living life like it's a marathon, not a sprint. A few years ago, I started studying grit in the Chicago public schools. I asked thousands of high school juniors to take grit questionnaires and then waited around more than a year to see who would graduate. Turns out that grittier kids were significantly more likely to graduate, even when I matched them on every characteristic I could measure, things like family income, standardized achievement test scores, even how safe kids felt when they were at school. So it's not just at West Point or the National Spelling Bee that grit matters, it's also in school especially for kids at risk for dropping in. 
To me, the most shocking thing about grit is how little we know, how little science knows about building it. Every day, parents and teachers ask me, how do I build grit in kids? What do I do to teach kids a solid work ethic? How do I keep them motivated for the long run? The honest answer is, I don't know. <laughs> what I do know is that talent doesn't make you gritty. Our data show very clearly that there are many talented individuals who simply do not follow through on their commitments. In fact, in our data, grit is usually unrelated or even inversely related to measures of talent. So far, the best idea I've heard about building grit in kids is something called growth mindset. This is an idea developed at Stanford University by Carol Dweck, and it is the belief that the ability to learn is not fixed, that it can change with your effort. Dr. Dweck has shown that when kids read and learn about the brain and how it changes and grows in response to challenge, they're much more likely to persevere when they fail because they don't believe that failure is a permanent condition. So growth mindset is a great idea for building grit, but we need more. And that's where I'm going to end my remarks, because that's where we are. That's the work that stands before us. We need to take our best ideas, our strongest intuitions, and we need to test them. We need to measure whether we've been successful, and we have to be willing to fail, to be wrong, to start over again with lessons learned. In other words, we need to be gritty about getting our kids grittier. Thank you. All right, what part of that resonates with what we do? Yes? I've actually been teaching quite a bit about growth mindset in my class, and a lot of my kids automatically, they're coming and thinking they're failures. They failed this long, especially in reading. And so I've been doing a lot of growth mindset. And then I also have the acronym for GRID. It's Growth, Resilience, um, Integrity, and Tenacity. And I teach them what each of those words mean and how it comes into the word GRID and how it just means basically anything, no matter what your past is, no matter what your parents tell you your past is, but if you push through anything, you can make it. And so I've been using that quite a bit this last week and a half in my class. Great. Thank you. What about the way we, we feel about failure? I mean, are we scared of failure? I like how you talk about it's a long-term process, that it's not something you just do in like a week or two weeks, that it has to take a while. Okay, a marathon versus a sprint. So I think part of that message goes to, we, we look at our, our students and perhaps they feel, you know, they feel like they, they can't make it, whether it's reading ability, whether it's writing, whether it's understanding, they might struggle with those things. And I, I would challenge ourselves to start looking at how and what do we do to make sure that we're encouraging and helping. Because I think if we look at our own, our own fears, we fear things. We fear things a lot, and, and I've mentioned it before in, in our faculty. I want us to make sure that as we're working together to help kids, we're not fearing, and, and we're willing to try to do things even if we fail, okay? If you try to do something and you fail, it's okay. It's all right. It's part of learning and becoming better at what we do. I fail a lot. I learn from it, and I try to become better. So as we talk a little bit about data and gathering data and looking at scores, it's not to single out things. It's an issue of us looking inward and saying, what am I going to do to overcome my fear as I'm helping these kids overcome their fear? Because it's real. It's real. So with PBIS, um, some of the things we're going to be working with and continue to build upon because there's a lot of work that's been done. Throughout the district, a lot of people come to our school and look at the work that's being done in PBIS because of the efforts that have been made. So I'm going to turn some time over to Dottie now so she can share um, some more information. Okay, so as I chat with you, and mind you, I'm sensitive about our time as well, 
is that we will be looking at the model of the growth mindset in these areas, effort, challenges, mistakes, feedback, as well as results. And as I talk, I really want you to be thinking about the fact that the team that's been working on this group has changed at least three times. And so we have different individuals who are working on this work. But as, as I move through these slides, I want you to be thinking about us as educators and how we have put forth efforts in uh, developing a positive behavior intervention system, which we call Lancer Pride. And I want to make sure that we are seeing that PBIS for us is Lancer Pride, and they're very interchangeable when we discuss them. Can you turn to our next one? So, I want to celebrate the expectations and the effort that has been placed in this school since we started in 2015. We developed school expectations. That took over 30 school teachers, some not here, but the majority of you are here. Some of you are nodding your head. This was hard work. And it took a lot for us to sit in the, in the classroom in the month of July to try to figure out what is it that we expect of our students. We also branded Lancer Pride in terms of thoughtful, empowered, and connected, and we're continuing to do so. You can recognize Lancer Pride by the various colors as well as the fonts, and that's a lot of support from uh, Marcia Chalmers and her group. We also developed incentive programs such as the G Cards, and there are many other programs in our school that reward students for behavior as well as academics. Then uh, we're in the process of continuing to build on the CARP videos, it's using them as a as a platform for us to make some adjustments in terms of building relationships and discussing those things that have been barriers to our students. So, um, so these are some of the efforts. And then I wanted to draw especially a thank you to Dr. Dunn for him being willing to change the norms to this particular language. That meant a lot to me personally because this work isn't just about students, it's about educators and administrators coming together. Next slide. So some challenges. There were several challenges, but the key points are these. Um, we needed tools and we needed time to teach the expectations, as well as the reinforcements. We also needed to be able to make sure that the Lancer Pride language was made available in our disclosures and in several other areas. I can say right now that that is still a work in progress, but this is still a challenge for a variety of different reasons. We also was unable to complete the behavior decision tree because there were so many possibilities. And as a high school, we were trained on junior high models. And so for a secondary high school model, it's very difficult to come up with something that isn't um, kind of junior high-ish. We had to look at something that was more adult, leading towards the role of accountability for our students. And then finally, we had challenges with our incentive delivery system. Some of you may know uh, that we had to shut down the G-Store because we were losing money on that. So next challenge, this slide. So some key mistakes. These are graphic mistakes, okay? That's why they're in the mistakes section, not the challenge section. Um, our first generation of G-Cards, if you can see that uh, the top icon there, is we put a dollar value to it. It was a great idea, we loved the idea, but the kids did something with it. They traded cards, they were holding on to them, they were using it, uh, all of it to purchase merchandise, so ultimately the school store couldn't make money, so it could not sustain the incentive system. Um, our second generation for G-Cards, we received them too late, the marketing was delayed, and so the excitement and everything that led up to it was missing, and so we're now focusing on that for this year. The Lancer Pride, uh, the Lancer Pride team, we didn't have any data that we could really track that said that our Lancer Pride efforts were really making a difference. So it, caused, it gave us a moment of reflection of what are we gonna do differently, all right? So let's go to the next slide. Here's some feedback. You can see the frowning face at the top for the considered critical feedback. Um, please, no Harbor videos on Mondays. It's now on Tuesday. Um, we do need educators handbook training. So our PDIS team, we received training this past week, and we will be making some adjustments there. Uh, students in advanced classes, they want a G cards. I'm going to tell you this. Those students who are in your high end AP concurrent honors classes, they need those G cards as much as the students who are you're trying to shape their behaviors to become strong learners. And then the G cards weren't being redeemed. We had 6,000 cards redeemed out of 23,000 cards that were distributed, or at least redeemed from our front office. We 
do have a problem or we do have a solution. Okay, next. Hard feedback. These are the happy feedback. They love the hard way. Okay? You you love them, your students love them. Now granted that isn't true for all of you, but for those who made that expression, it has made a difference. The subtle relationship shift. Uh, love the scratch cards, our second generation G cards. I love them. The kids didn't like all the candy bars, but they didn't say they wouldn't go collect it. Okay? Um, the kids also seem better, should say students. Um, they are. I hear comments all this last couple of weeks. The kids are different. They're better and better. And we like that. Many of you like OCR. You like the fact that kids are being held accountable early on. And I have to agree, because when they start in ninth grade, the chances of them being more successful over time will, will increase. And then finally, we have great student leadership with Lance and Pride Cultures. We have more students making more decisions about Lance and Pride decisions, including the Harvard video and more. Okay, next. So, this is where I need your help. I'm going to invite Josh to to come up here. Um, we have now the school-wide expectations for our faculty when we get together. But in conversations with so many of you, we know that this is the appropriate time for us to actually have school-wide expectations for all of our students. So as you look at this, this wasn't something that was generated overnight. These were many conversations that were held through the Freshman Academy, who that group of students are now 10th grade. That put us in a position where we have to look at school-wide expectations that would be consistent for all of our students from ninth grade up through 12th, of which now we have them in our 10th grade year. So I wanted uh, Josh to visit with me about what they um, uncovered in just a few minutes, uh, the discussions in uh, Freshman Academy that led to this particular uh, change. It was super awesome when Dottie pulls into her office and says, hey, today I want you to talk to the faculty. So that's awesome, by the way. Um, so you should understand that the things that we're doing in Freshman Academy um, are a result of all of the teachers and Ben Anderson. Um, ben doesn't like to take credit for anything. He hates being recognized, which is part of the reason I like him, because he's so humble in a lot of ways. I know some of you probably don't believe that. Um, <laughs> But uh, Ben has been a huge driving force behind what we've been trying to accomplish in the Freshman Academy. Um, and he's uh, a major reason that we are where we are right now. Um, if we, uh, in fact, we have a meeting tomorrow with all the other Freshman Academies in the district. And when we go, all the other schools come to Granger and they say, what are you doing? Because we want to mimic that. So the school that everyone often talks negatively about, the teachers from the other schools come to and say, what are you doing? Because we want to mimic because you're doing it well, okay? So kudos to all the freshman teachers, good job. Um, and we wanted to, uh, Dottie asked me to just talk about some of the things that we've put in place this year so that you're aware, especially moving forward, the expectations that we've created for the freshmen. What we're seeing is we're creating kind of like an uptick for the kids. We recognize that coming from junior high is hard. So we kind of slowly implement things to the kids, but then we have this expectation for them and we hold them to that standard. The problem is they then leave their freshman year and they go on to their sophomore year and there is no more consistent expectation. It changes per classroom. And so that's a problem. What kids need is they need consistency. And so one of the goals that has been in place is that some of the things that we're doing in the freshman <coughs> academy will then move into sophomore, junior, and senior year as well. And so part of what um, Dottie asked me to be on the PBIS team this year, part of that was to work with the other PBIS teachers to create consistency across the school. So we sat down as a group, and I'm telling you right now, getting consistency with a group of teachers is hard, right? Like we all have our goddom, which is our classroom, and you're like, don't mess with my goddom. Like if someone comes into your room, they're like, change things. You're like, oh, excuse me, I'm the god of this room. Get out. I'm doing it my way. Right? So getting consistency among teachers is hard, and it's taken a lot of us like talking and, and letting teachers express their frustrations and say, I don't like that idea, and here's why I don't like that idea, and trying to work through all of that. And sometimes it means putting aside our own ideas and our own biases about something in order to try something new, and sometimes we failed at that as a, as a group. But we learned from that. So this year, some of the things that we put in place, and 
we're going to try to uh, move school-wide, uh, go along this line. Um, we created a cell phone policy for all of the freshmen. And all the freshman teachers um, have been asked, and they said, yeah, we will follow that cell phone policy. So our cell phone policy is this. Cell phones are only acceptable with the teacher's permission. In fact, when students come in the room, the teachers have been encouraged to say to their students, make sure you put your headphones away. They should not be visible. And your cell phones as well. So they're reminded when they come into class, your cell phones should be put away and your headphones should be put away. Okay? Yeah, look, clap anytime you like anything. If you don't like it, just shut up. Um, <laughs> totally joking. I'm going to get in trouble. Dr. Dunn's already in the back. Like, One more. Um, so we've tried to put it a, in place a queuing system. Um, I'll be honest with you, it's hard because as teachers, you've got a lot of stuff you got to do, right? Like remembering to turn that cue card, like we have red and green, green meaning it's okay to have your cell phone out right now, red meaning it's not okay. That's super hard, right? So when I'm teaching the sophomore uh, success kids, I just tell them, I'll tell you when you can have your phone out. If I haven't explicitly told you you can have it out, it better not be out. But they're also reminded every day when I walk into class after greeting them at the door, remember your headphones should be put away, remember your cell phone should be put away. Um, and then what happens is kids are given a warning because we're kind, friendly, and giving. So if they have their cell phone out, they're given one warning. And then after that warning, in that same class period, if that cell phone comes out or those headphones come out again, um, we take them. And they get them back at the end of the day. Now if that happens again in another class period, we keep the headphones or the cell phone for the entire day. And at that point, the student is also then referred to me or to an administrator. And then we work out a cell phone contract <coughs> policy with the students. We talk to them about the fact that their cell phone is obviously distracting them in class. And we have a good conversation with them about that. And I do the same thing now with the sophomores. So we're working on implementing that, year, that this year with Tim Munt as I'm working with the sophomores as well. And so um, at that point, if they, a third time the phone gets taken, we do a parent conference. We bring the parents in. We have a conversation with the parents about how the cell, cell phone is impeding the student's ability to be successful. And we're probably also going to refer them to a student university, a parent university that uh, Jeff Jackson is working with. And it's to teach parents how to be better with their kids and how to help them be successful in school. Um, <coughs> do you want me to cover all of them? No. Just, um, and so with this, we've kind of created the Lancer Pride, and this is the draft, this is what uh, Dottie and I were talking about. This is all based on the things we're doing, like we're allowing the kids to show proficiency over and over and over again. So if they don't do great on that test, they get to take that test again and again and again <coughs> until they prove it to us. And we recognize, <coughs> oh my gosh, I can tell you from the fights we've had me. we recognize that that's frustrating, and we recognize that in the business world, the boss doesn't say, do it again, and do it again. And do. We are in a catch-22 in education. College and Career Ready says that in college, the teacher doesn't care. It's due when it's due. In the business world, the boss doesn't care. It's due when it's due. But in education, we also recognize that students learn at different time frames. And if we don't give them that opportunity, there's no incentive for them to continue to try. We are in a catch-22. We acknowledge that, that it sucks. It makes it easier. And it sucks. And I promise you, we've had that battle over and over in our meetings together with each other. So as a part of that, we're saying things like, students are empowered by participating to show proficiency throughout the day, throughout daily learning activities. Meaning the kid can show, hey, I didn't get it last week, but I get it today. And they should get credit for that. I didn't say they should get 100%. There is a distinction. I can say, here are my kids who are A's that get it from the beginning, and here are my kids that are C's. They learned it, but they didn't learn it in time. So I can create that distinction, because my wife would be one of those kids that would say, how come I got it the first time and I got an A, and that kid took two months and they got an A? Then why am I doing it now? Well, you can still create that level. It still gives them an incentive because they'll still pass. Right? So we do things like OCR, getting to class on time, um, contributing to meaningful class discussion, accepting diverse opinions. That goes along with teaching the kids that it's OK to have someone else think something differently than you. Um, being organized, one of the things that we teach the kids in the freshman academy is they have to have a binder, and they're supposed to use it. So the freshman teachers have agreed that they'll tell the kids, put that in your binder, get your binder out. We even uh, work with calendaring with them. And then maintaining a positive and respectful attitude. 
Um, we want the, the kids come from, the junior highs are super like, they're not allowed to have cell phones, they have really rigid rules. And we finally realized why aren't we utilizing those rigid rules they're already used to. So when they get to us, we're saying, hey, we're just moving what, what you're already used to and we're gonna add some stuff to uh, um, And this, this has been a hard process. This is uh, my third year in the position that I'm in. And I've watched as teachers like have literally sat in meetings like, I hate that idea. I hate, hate that idea. With other teachers saying, I love this idea. And then finding a way to find some compromise in the middle that works for everybody. That they can then say, I'm gonna back that idea. And I'm gonna teach that to my kids. So with that, what we're asking with this is that you actually start to use the language that's there. And I realize that that's really hard. When you say to a student, Look, you're being thoughtful. You, you feel like you're an idiot when you say that, right? I recognize you're being thoughtful by not using your cell phone. It feels kind of silly to say that, but we're asking you to start using this language because then when it becomes consistent, it doesn't matter if they're a freshman, a sophomore, a junior, or a senior, it's the same. They get it from everyone the same. And that expectation becomes the same throughout their high school career. And what we see and what we believe is that if we can do this from ninth grade and then sophomore, by the time they are juniors and seniors, they already know how this works. And we change the culture of the school, which is the ultimate goal. Is that if we can start teaching them in ninth grade, we'll change the culture of the school so by the time kids are seniors, they're the ones telling the sophomores and the freshmen how it works. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Can I provide anecdotal evidence of it working? Yeah. Only if it's awesome. Okay. for students are is something that we actually want to post in every single classroom but in order for us to do this I'm going to need you to look at this be reflective but I also am going to ask for at least 80% of you to raise your hands to say yes you are in support of this you're willing to be committed to using the language of thoughtful and thoroughly connected and that we will follow suit we want to maintain the integrity of the work that's been done in ninth grade to follow through in 10th all the way through their senior year because as we do this I I promise you our school culture will continue to improve not only behaviorally but especially academically. So by the raise of your hands, would you please raise your hand if you will support this um, school-wide effort? Wow, that's intense. Thank you so very much. And will you give a thanks to your freshman academy for laying the ground? to our time, the final uh, page is actually on results. I will send the results to you with some guidelines on how to look forward to this information in the future. Thank you very much for your time. One of the things that is part of Granger is the culture. And hopefully this year you felt as we've started, um, just the, the climate within the building, the expectations that students have, it feels great. But this is an effort that we all are part of. Okay, this is, if we set expectations, we expect kids to meet those expectations. And if we work collectively, it becomes um, a lot more successful. So, okay, thank you PBIs. The rest of the year, I, I believe, I'm not sure, but I think that um, the Granite Way PD this year is focused in this area. So our first meeting with PBI, or sorry, with Granite Way PD is this month, and then we start um, in October. We'll start with what the district has given us. The information we share today is to get us off started so we're on the same page with things. Um, and then 
when May comes, we don't end up having that last um, Brian and Wayne TV because we started in September. So, that May is always a good time. All right. Can you go ahead and click off of that? Is that the end of that? Yes. Can you go to the next? All right. Shifting a little bit, still in the area of, of um, G3, we're going to talk a little bit about and share some information um, in the area of growth and what that looks like. Um, we, we sometimes will throw terms out there and say, well, growth, yes, we know, we, we think we understand what it looks like in terms of assessments and we can see results from it. But we continue to build upon what we've already done. And that's this with the instructional coaches, that's what we're going to share in, in the next little while. So go to the next slide, please. Here's kind of a breakdown of what we're going to do. No, right there. A little bit of a road trip of last year. And then we have a couple of teachers who will share out their experience of what they accomplished this summer. And continuing to build on that work. When I had, I spoke to a few of you visiting classrooms at the beginning of the year, and some of you mentioned, you know, the work that we did those two days was pretty meaningful. Hopefully next summer we can continue to build on it, because all that stuff has now laid things out for this year. Hopefully we're not scrambling as much. We'll talk a little bit about this year's focus in terms of G3, then assessment results uh, to guide instruction and G3 accountability trend data. Next. Okay, critical question. How can Granger's explicitly plan instruction and collaboration initiative provide rigorous and meaningful learning that leads to college and career readiness for all students? We're going to address that question because just like uh, PBIS has done in the school, their progress has been a result of looking at data, looking at results. The uh, Duckworth 